Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Um, you know, during last year's midterm elections, a lot of us, myself included, pinned our hearts and wishes on the extinction of Senator Tond, Ted Cruz's political career, and candidate Beto O'Rourke's historical ascent in Texas politics. Unfortunately, though, the beast was not vanquished. But fortunately, Beto's historic campaign was documented by our next guest, David Modigliani, in his new movie, Running with Beto. Let's take a look. You know what? The camera's all messed up on this thing. Why? I don't know. We're like in a dream. There's something very inhumane and un-American taking place right now. Beto and I were like, okay, what can we do to change this dialogue at a national level? And when you have an opponent like Cruz, that just seemed like a very easy answer. The hard left is angry. They're energized and they're coming for Texas. Out of that conversation came this idea of what if we ran for Senate? I'm traveling to all 254 counties to meet everybody that I can. We're going to meet live on Facebook for 24 hours straight. This is either my best idea ever or my last idea ever. I went up to Beto and I told him, I said, here's the deal, man. You better bring brains, backbone, and balls to the table or go home. Because of all the negative attack ads on Beto, because we're not punching back hard enough, everyone is telling you you're doing it wrong. I just really miss the kids. I'm ready for it to be over. You all ready to do this? There's a reason why the people down here say that their vote doesn't matter. I mean, I hope I'm wrong. People have brought out the very best in themselves. Somehow we've got to be able to continue to feel that way. Everybody, please welcome director David Modigliani and producer Rebecca Pfefferman. Let's hear it. Hey, Hi. thanks for having us. Uh, thank you so much for being here. David, I feel like just looking at you, you would get along really well with Beto O'Rourke. <laughs> I don't know. Like, you just seem like brothers of some kind. We, uh, very early in the campaign, we were in Corpus Christi, and he was doing a 6 a.m. run. And I think some local joggers kind of joined up. They, oh, we'll go meet this political candidate. And our film van got there before Beto, and I got out of the van, and people kind of, like, started clapping. And I was like, I'm the other skinny white guy. Like, that's, it's not me. Yeah. Um, so how did this start? Because one of the things that's interesting about the documentary is you guys are there really before the media blitz hits hits Beto, before people really knew about, about him. So how did you find out about him? There were hundreds of Democrats running for seats that seemed impossible during the midterms in November. Well, like many great things in life, it comes back to baseball. So I'm a founding member of a Sandlot baseball team in Austin, and we have teams, friends that'll form teams and come play us. And so in April of 2017, Los Diablitos de El Paso showed up in Austin, uh, and they had this lanky center fielder with a, a funny name that I hadn't heard before, and he happened to be a U.S. congressman. He, he had announced about six weeks prior that he was running for the U.S. Senate. So I was playing first base, and he hit a single, and he had a little chance to chat there um and then uh no, it was literally he was on first base like yeah yeah so you know that was a good opportunity to do a little get to know you um and and i had been looking for a story i think post 2016 just feeling how much we dehumanize each other through politics for a story that might rehumanize it or make it feel accessible and so when beto jumped up on a hay bale at the game during the seventh inning stretch and he he brushed his sweaty locks aside in his dirty uniform, and it was like clear, like, this guy is a, a movie star. Um, but when he described the kind of campaign that he was running, that's what made it, you know, from, as you say, there's all these sort of fascinating candidates out there. But he was like, I'm going to go to every county in Texas, including the most conservative ones. Um, I'm going to only raise money from other human beings, not corporations or PACs. I'm not hiring consultants. He was ready to take a bunch of risks and try something new, and that felt like an odyssey that might be really exciting to, to follow. When did it feel like while making the documentary that you may have struck a little gold there? Because everybody, oftentimes people go out to make, set out to make documentaries and, you know, they get maybe 30 minutes of, of good stuff there because it doesn't really pan out. But at a certain point, he clicked, Beto clicks and you realize, oh, we've got a full movie here now. 
Yeah, I mean, I think um, Rebecca and I were both yeah. exposed to him pretty early, uh, in, in, and we got that sense, like, this guy is a generational political talent. And living in Texas also had a feel for the energy in that state that was really ripe for a reawakening and was sort of looking for a leader. And so we sort of saw this cocktail that was, that was about to ignite. Um, and it almost felt like it was a matter of time. So the NFL kneeling video, and he spoke about the NFL players kneeling during the national anthem, that sort of took off and went viral uh, over the summer. And that there really was a before and an after, as Rebecca says, of that, that moment um, really catapulted him into the national stage. It started to become a household name. But it felt like uh, it could have been a different moment. It, um, something that was revelatory of his character was going to catch the national mood. Um, but it certainly did. It was exciting to feel like, oh, this guy that we've been, you know, got a lot of texts like, is this the guy you were telling me about? That's the guy you're following? Um, and so it's exciting to have people curious about someone that we um, have some really, you know, revealing and intimate moments on, on camera with. I think it was evident to anybody who's seen him in a person at any point of his trajectory that he had that quality about him, whether it was a room full of 10 people or 200 people, he has this magnetism. And David and I, David met him on first base. I met him around the same time and uh, no one knew how to say his name. And it was like, he still was just connecting with people in a way that was so striking. And it was just clear that he, he was gonna be appealing. And in many ways, the level of super stratosphere he hit maybe seems slightly surprising, but the fact that it happened was not in any way, shape, or form surprising. And it really was wild to watch the, like, from one day to the next, the, the things just explode for him. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say it was interesting because it, it, um, that explosion also made our job more challenging. So at the same time that it was exciting that all these people were now interested in him, um, you had the national and international media parachuting into these tiny towns in Texas, like crews from Japan and South Korea and Australia. And they were running this really lean operation where it was like him and a couple of staffers. And so they were just sort of besieged and inundated with all of this attention in addition to all the supporters that were pushing food and cookies into the van and the whole Well, they were thing. besieged so by like, camera crews who were going to yes. get them national attention like this yes. versus the small documentary crew that's going to release something in like a year and a half. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we really had to, over those closing couple of months, um, battle to make sure that we kept the access that was really getting something revelatory. And it was a testament to them that they, that they allowed uh, us to do that and they really followed through. Mm -hmm. Did you find that, was there anything off limits? Because one of the things that's surprising about the doc is, um, you know, moments where he is frustrated with his crew and frustrated with the campaign. Yeah, it was it was very important to us to make um, a fully independent film, creatively, financially, separate from the campaign. They had no access to the footage. They had no rights to approve it or disprove it. Um, and um, we wanted to capture those moments that show the frustrations and challenges of what it's really like to run for office, warts and all, the challenges with the team, you're sort of building the plane while you're flying it, um, and it's kind of a controlled chaos. Um, and then also his family and his kids as they try to hold their family bond together while he's home basically you know, two days a month. So um, all that stuff and, and conflict was really important to us to try to capture, and we were able to get enough, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the intimacy of this film, which was so important to us, was this larger story. Like, Beto is at the center of it, and his family and his team and what's happening around the campaign. But ultimately, it was, for us, a much bigger story about this moment in time, the personal stakes and, like, the real people and the faces of what the impact of this election would have. Um, and we, we see that in one of his supporters, yeah. who's incredible. I mean, all of his supporters and campaigners are very dedicated, but there's one, one woman in particular who is, yeah, who is so, has her heart really set on him and really set on the political process and moving things forward. And you can see the, the stakes that are, that are in it for her. Yeah, it was important to us to have, we followed three ordinary Texas citizens um, along the, the 12 months that we were shooting the film, and because they were all first time activists who had gotten involved for very personal reasons that were unique to them. They were um, diverse culturally. They were diverse geographically across the state by age. I mean, aren't we followed a high school student who was affected by um, gun violence and quit the football team to become an activist. 
Um, and we met him before he met Beto. So he was coming in kind of like, I don't know, is this guy really serious? But you really see he's a young kid. And when he, it's actually a moment that didn't quite make the film, but there's a moment where he was talking to us about what he went through when he was, he was uh, teaching Sunday school and had to barricade the children, that, the toddlers he was teaching into a room so that they were protected from a shooting rampage that was happening at his church. And he said something, and he's looking at the camera, and he said something about, like, there's a look in their eyes that you just can't ever unsee. And this is, like, a 16-year-old kid, and it just really lands home. All the, the, the stakes were so high, and you feel that with Marcel, this, this young boy, Shannon, you mentioned, um, whose husband was a, a Marine um, and had some really severe mental health issues when he came out, and it was traumatic, and so she was engaged in veterans' issues. And then um, Amanda... Not just veterans' issues, though, women's issues as well, and right. she has an incredible right. line about Ted Cruz where she says, um, I don't ask you whether or not right. you're circumcised. You don't get to ask me questions about my body. Right. Which I thought was yeah. pretty great. Very accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you when you get on the ground and you start working with him, was there a fear? I mean, I know you said you could sense that he was magnetic and charismatic and had, you know, sort of like generational politician quality. But was there any set were you ever worried that it wasn't going to pan out or did it really feel like right away that this was snowballing? It really felt right away like it was snowballing. Um, I think the the stress on, the stress really came from trying to keep up with them. Um, you know, not in the film, but we got pulled over three times. Once going 97 miles an hour in a 65. Trying to catch uh, up to them? Um, no, he got pulled over. Oh, he over. got pulled yeah, over. Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, and then. Um, he, you know, they wouldn't stop for lunch and they would change uh, their plans on a, on a dime and, and no, we're actually going to go to this town today. And so just to, um, as they were so inundated, especially later on, just logistically to try to keep pace with them, um, but then also to maintain the access, that was really the stress. Like on election night, are we going to get the goods? Are we going to get them emotionally processing the outcome of this election. Um, but it, it really always felt like this thing was snowballing in a special direction. The ascension was so rapid too. I mean, we had the luxury, most documentaries you don't have the luxury of a known timeline. And we knew there was a ending right. that we were aiming for and a, and, a, and a construct in which we were filming. But I mean, we started shooting November, 2017. And we're documentary filmmakers making independent films. So we needed to find some financing and we put together this pitch deck and we had a working title of it, and we, you know, it was running with Beto, which has now ended up being the title of the film. But we we felt like we got to get a subheading in here with the name Ted Cruz in it because no one's going to know what this movie's about. No one's going to understand what the stakes are, or why it's a significant story, or why it's worth telling whether or not he wins or loses because there it's not going to feel big enough. And um, in that twelve month period, we went from we need Ted Cruz's name in the title to as we were discussing running with Beto, we don't even need O'Rourke, to we actually really considered, seriously considered, do we need Beto in the title? I mean, that momentum was so obvious. Picture, so, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we talked about it. I mean, it was a, it was a discussion item. So yeah, he had the quality. The stakes were so high. The attention was so um, focused from a national perspective because of the Cruz factor at first, but also all these issues that just ran right through Texas in the middle of the midterm election. Immigration, gun control, women's rights, health care, and Beto was right at the center of that. This is tangential, but when we talk about uh, Beto and we say there was like, you know, he's charismatic and he's magnetic and there's something so special about him and you can tell... I feel like conservatives say that about Ted Cruz, and that is a fascinating divide yeah. to me because that is solely based on how you emotionally respond to someone. Right. It's not even what they're saying because I see Ted Cruz and I'm like, oh my God, it's like a wet rag that somehow knows how to talk. Yeah. Yeah. But like for some reason, it, like people are, are drawn to him. Isn't, do you find that fascinating? I don't know how many hardcore Ted Cruz you know, passionate Ted Cruz supporters there are. I think there's a lot of people. He was going to run. He ran for president. He, he did. Had big support. He was the big. It's true. He was the runner guy. up. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I guess it's like, I think there's a lot of people that believe that he represents their values and that he can be an effective, um, you know, legislator and leader on their behalf. And there must be some people that do feel really drawn to him as a leader. Our sense was 
largely that there were a lot of Republicans in Texas, um, and you see one of them in Amanda's father in the film, who j doesn't love Cruz but just can't bring himself to vote for a Democrat. His, his cultural identity is so rooted. Um, he says, as a matter of fact, you'd have to shoot me to vote for a Democrat. Like, it's just so off limits to him, even though he doesn't love Cruz. Um, and you have, I mean, Ted Cruz, you know, there's a lot, George W. Bush said, I don't like the guy. You had yeah. Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Graham, who said if Ted Cruz were killed on the floor of the Senate and the trial was in the Senate, nobody would be convicted. I think Al Franken said, I don't hate anybody, but I hate Ted Cruz yeah. as well. And John yeah. Boehner called him Lucifer incarnate. So, and that's like just the top. I mean, there's a lot. So, um, it, I mean, he was, he's an amazing foil, uh, and he's not in the film a lot, but um, I think if Beto sort of represents what politics could be, the idea of sort of transparency, accountability, no pack money, um, you know, saying what you really think, uh, Cruz represents a lot of what we dislike about politics, I think including Republicans, um, but many felt that they could not bring themselves to vote for somebody else. Did you find along the campaign trail that Beto also appealed policy-wise to, to, to people on the, on the right side of the country, that Texans who were Republicans in a lot of ways did feel like they could understand where he was coming from? I don't, I don't know that I would go so far as to say that like his policy positions connected with the conservatives in the state, but his manner did. His ability to go to where they were even though, you know, he went to, he, you've heard him say it, all 254 counties of Texas. Texas is, is bigger than France geographically um, and some of the reddest con counties in the country. But he would go there anyway to these tiny town halls and he would sit down with these people and he would listen and he would talk to them and he would internalize what they said and he made people feel, even if they didn't agree with his policies, that at least perhaps that he was, um, he showed up for them and it was worth giving him their their attention. Um, and, and I think that was a quality that really resonated, especially with all these, a lot of folks who maybe aren't Ted Cruz fans and are tried and true conservatives, but really want somebody who's gonna be honest and straight up with them, and Beto did that. And we, um, we really wanted to invite we, we want this film to be open to conservatives, to so people that may not agree with Beto on a policy basis. We did a test screening um, while we were in the final stages of our edit um, for 20 self-identified conservative Republicans. Um, and a big way that they connected with the story was through the family. Um, so through seeing his three kids, her 8, 10, and 12, his wife, you know, he's home about two days a month for a couple of years. Uh, and they really connected with like, this guy is trying to preserve his relationships with his family while he seems to be pretty you know earnest and authentic about what he's trying to go accomplish the idea of sort of public service in general um, and you know a movie like Mitt which was about Mitt Romney's 2012 failed campaign um, I might not agree with you know Mitt Romney's policy positions but I felt welcomed into that film I didn't feel uh, like I was kept out and so we're eager and hopeful um, that people who may not agree with Beto politically may get something out of this film a sense of what it's really like to run for office a sense that you you don't have to be an expert to be part of a political campaign, no matter what part of the political spectrum you're on, that, you know, it's never too late or too early to just get involved in the democratic process. Um, so, you know, I think many people may see this and just sort of turn away if they are, uh, you know, lean to the right. But we hope that. Um, no, word it's a documentary out, about a so. campaign. It's not yeah. necessarily necessarily a documentary about democratic politics or, or Republican politics. I am shocked that you just referenced Mitt on this stage. It's a documentary that I completely forgot existed. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a minute to go, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Sorry, you were going to say something. Oh, no. I mean, I think to David's point and, and, and even to yours, I mean, it's like the sort of the, the human face of, for people who don't, might not agree with the policies um, or the democratic positions or, or Beto as a candidate, there is so much in this film that isn't about him. And it's the idea of um, sort of, putting out a human face to what these issues really are. And maybe you have a really strong position on the Second Amendment, but you listen to Marcel talk, and maybe it's going to connect with you in a different way than just sort of your blanket understanding of my policies and you're a liberal and you want to take my guns away. And I think, I think that's so important for us. At, when we made this film, we set out to tell the story of what the bigger picture is. The fact that Beto O'Rourke is now running for president 
is a surprise to all of us. Um, certainly in November 2017, when we were starting to make this film, this wasn't on the docket. So um, the goal he was... Didn't, he didn't lean over at first base and was yeah, like, he was I'm going to make it really close in Texas, <laughs> and then I'm going to run for president. Yeah, no. I mean, I think the goal was always to have impact that would last longer than any one election. Have you, uh, have you been in touch with him at all since, uh, the can- since he started running for president? So he uh, came to the premiere at South by Southwest um, with his wife, Amy. Um, it was really special to have them there and, and his daughter, Molly, yeah, and the, the senior staff. You know, you ask a lot of trust from someone like that, especially in the case where they didn't have approval over the cut. And they came and sat in the theater and watched it with everybody else. And I think it was intense for them to relive this experience which was so fresh emotionally um but they were really kind and supportive and and i think did he know that you had had like scenes of him sort of sniping at his campaign i I don't know i think he had a sense of it he was sort of like like, he he sort of gave this look like he's like you have a lot of footage don't you you know sort of like um so uh i think he was okay with um you know, I'm sure he, it, he said it was uncomfortable to watch himself on screen during those moments. But I think in the bigger picture, he gets the value of having an honest film um, where sort of the good moments uh, where, where, where you see how special he is are earned because you also see how, you know, frustrated or imperfect um, he may be. So we've been in touch a little bit, um, but uh, he's obviously a pretty busy, busy guy. Yeah, I'll say also those moments where he is, you know, I said sniping at his staff. He's not. And I think, like, if that was my boss, that's fine. Like, nothing he does right. is particularly bad. He's literally like, right. hey, this thing that you I asked you to do, you didn't do. Do you mind if you do it next time? <laughs> like, that's how, that's how mean he is as a boss. And the person's like, yeah, okay. That's no problem, Beto. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who has a question? Right here. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is a question uh, from online, our website, buildseries.com. What would your advice be to young filmmakers and storytellers looking to use their medium as a way of progressing social change? That's a great question. Um, Start shooting. I think that's the special uh, aspect of documentary film as opposed to narrative filmmaking. So if you're making a fiction, you got to write your script and then you're going to go get money and then you're going to plan it all and you're going to shoot it in 20 days or 30 days or 40 days. Um, and you're sort of waiting to, to be green lit and press go. I think what's so special about the documentary medium is now you can even pull out your phone and just start, just start shooting and start getting footage, start getting something you can show to other people to tease it, um, to give some sense of the vision of what you have, which then, then allow you to raise money, build a team, and sort of realize a larger vision. Um, I think as far as you know, progressing social change, I think so much of it is about empathy. It's part of what Rebecca was talking about 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 Marcel that um, I think when 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 you're able to show the lived human experience um, of individuals uh, as they experience policy as they experience um, some of these sort of abstract concepts in their daily lives um, that is an invitation to people who are watching uh, a film like that from a young filmmaker um, to 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 have a to, to, to empathize with that person as a human being um, and perhaps be open to changing their mindset about a particular issue. And I would add to that just the idea of whatever the issue is that somebody wants to capture and tell a story around to have a larger impact, that can be a very daunting, big task because it can be a big issue and it's like, how do you even focus and how do you know what area you really want to have the most impact on? And I would just say in anything, the more you hone in on what your passion is of that particular large scale construct, that's going to help be your North Star and guide you through it so that once you have captured that footage, once you are in that moment and feeling those things and connecting and and responding to what's in front of you, then when you turn it around and you go to somebody to to push your larger picture agenda, you're going to have all that behind you. And then you're not going to question any of it because you're going to know the whole way you were on point for what you really wanted to make. This is now this person is getting much more advice than they asked for. But that made me think of, I think the other thing is like, nobody wants to watch a film about an idea. Nobody wants to watch a film about a theme. If you're like, I made this movie, it's about climate change. You're like, I don't, you know, as opposed to, I made this movie about these people who live on an island that is getting flooded and they're having to like pack up their home and they're moving and they're trying to figure out what to do. So it is about finding like individual specific personal stories um, that embody a theme or an idea as opposed to trying to make a film about the idea. 
Do you ever have uh, insecurity about how much social change your your work can have or, or, or may have? Do you ever worry when you're in the midst of a project or when you think about the think about starting a project? Do you ever get insecure about the worth of it or is it necessary or how am I affecting the world? Do these things even affect the world? Yeah, I you know I've definitely thought you know because but it's sort of post 2016 election had this feeling of. You know what can I do as part? What what we we are in a crisis in democracy. Like what is what can I do? And I feel like oh I'm a storyteller. So what you know? But certainly had questions of like well should I just be taking all of the time that we're doing making this film and be volunteering for a campaign or working for a political campaign? Um, and for that reason, it's been really satisfying in the initial screenings we've done in the film. Last night, we had our New York premiere. Um, it'll be out on HBO next week. Um, but the people that are first seeing this film seem to walk out of the theater feeling re-energized and recommitted. I think we're in this moment where the 2018 midterms were rewarding in some ways for progressives, winning back the house, but also it just utterly exhausting. And Things have, the uh, president is utterly exhausting right. on and, a daily and, and sort basis. of things have only worsened in some sense since then. And so we're sort of in this place where we need to emotionally gear up and sort of recommit and be ready to go all in again for an even bigger push. And so it's been satisfying to see people walk out of the theater and say, like, this fired me up. Mm -hmm. And that makes me feel like, OK, we are we're helping here. And, and, and this project that we've worked on um, will you know, will, will help in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one more question. Hi, how's it going? Um, so I was just wondering, uh, when making a documentary with something as specific of a time window as a political campaign, uh, do you feel kind of stressed to find that narrative through line, or is it something you're just kind of open to coming to you when it does? Well, one of the great things about a campaign is that it offers you this narrative backbone, right? And you know, like, there's this, there's a, there's a high stakes thing that's going to happen. Uh, the characters you're following are going to have a big emotional response to it. You know exactly when that's going to happen and you can plan around it. That's why you see so many docs that are like about a spelling bee or like a tiddlywinks competition or just anything that has this sort of built in structure. Because so many docs wind up, you're shooting in year five and say, well, I don't know if we're done yet. You know, I don't know quite. Mm -hmm. And so, there's real value in that and knowing that there's going to be a, um, a payoff. It also allowed us to start editing the film six months before um, the election because we knew we wanted to turn it around quickly and we knew that we would essentially stop shooting you know, on election night or shortly um, thereafter. So elections, I think, do lend themselves well to doc filmmaking. Um, there are many sort of trite uh, uh, there's so many docs about a campaign that we were always trying to think about what can we do that's different um, you know, from so many campaign documentaries that are out there. But also keeping in mind, like always having the answer to yourself, what is the central question? What are we answering here? Are we trying to answer, like, is he going to win? And that was not the answer. And a lot of times the momentum, the energy around the race, the people coming in from the outside, you know, there is, an, there is a propulsion to sort of be like, well, oh, okay, are we following this? And then having to check back in and look at what we've got already, what we have that conversation with the editors and just be like, what is the story we're really trying to tell here? And doing that constantly. So that in every scene knowing like, well, we don't have to be at every town hall. Because at some point, all the town halls are relatively similar. And we don't have to be at everywhere he is because we know we've already got that section of the film kind of covered. So using that as sort of a checks and balances as we went, keeping in mind the whole way, like what is the what is the bigger question we're trying to answer? Absolutely. Um, guys, congratulations on the documentary. Thank you. It premieres Thank you. Uh, Tuesday night, next week, right? 28, yeah. 8 p.m., HBO. And we are at Running With Beto on Instagram and Twitter. We're going to be releasing some clips that are not in the film. So follow us at Running With Beto for some, some more fun stuff behind the scenes. Amazing. And tune in Tuesday night, May 28th on HBO. And give them a huge round of applause for Thank being you. here. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Thank you. Thank you.